In this presentation, we're going to look at the health aspects of wastewater use in agriculture, and in particular, the health risks involved. An actual risk to public health occurs when all four of the following conditions are met. Firstly, an infective dose of an excreted pathogen reaches the wastewater irrigated field, or the pathogen multiplies in the field to form an infective dose. Secondly, the infective dose reaches a human host. Thirdly, the host becomes infected. And fourthly, the infection causes disease or further transmission. If the first three conditions are met, but not the fourth, the risk is not an actual risk, but only a potential one. Furthermore, the agricultural use of wastewater is only of public health importance if it causes an excess incidence of disease, an excess prevalence of disease, or an excess intensity of infection. And it does if the wastewater is untreated, but it doesn't if the wastewater is treated correctly. We know this from the epidemiological evidence, which we're now going to examine. First of all, we're going to look at some evidence from India. The chart shows the prevalence of hookworm infection and ascaris infection in a group of sewage farm workers, and in India, sewage farms means irrigation with untreated wastewater, compared with these infections in a control group. You can see that in both cases, and for the total positive, there are clear excess prevalences of infection. This chart shows, for the same groups of people, the percentages with medium to heavy intensities of infection with hookworms and ascaris, and you can see that there are clear excess intensities of infection between the two groups in both cases. Now we're looking at ascaris prevalences in several German cities immediately after World War II. In fact, we're looking at ascaris prevalences in the general population who ate irrigated salad crops. In Darmstadt, where untreated wastewater was used for crop irrigation, the prevalence was around 50%, and in one suburb, Greisheim, it was about 90%. But in Berlin, where treated wastewater was used for irrigation, the prevalence of ascaris was much lower, under 5%, and about the same as in cities which didn't use wastewater for irrigation. In Berlin, the treatment used was conventional treatment, primary sedimentation, trickling filters, and secondary sedimentation, and the two periods of sedimentation effectively removed most, if not all, of the ascaris eggs. Now we're going to examine the situation in Jerusalem over the period from 1935 to 1982. In fact, we're looking at the prevalence of ascaris infection in the population of western Jerusalem. Up to 1947, these people bought and ate salad crops irrigated with untreated water just outside eastern Jerusalem, and their ascaris prevalence was about 36%. 1948 saw the creation of the State of Israel and the first Arab-Israeli war, one outcome of which was that Jerusalem was partitioned, and this meant that the raw wastewater irrigated salad crops from eastern Jerusalem could not be sold to the residents of western Jerusalem, and this had the effect that their prevalence of ascaris fell to around 2% over the next 18 years. In 1966 there was another war, and the outcome of this one was that the city of Jerusalem was reunited, so once again the raw wastewater irrigated salad crops from eastern Jerusalem were on sale in western Jerusalem, and over the next five years ascaris prevalence in western Jerusalem increased to around 13%. In 1970 the irrigation of salad crops with untreated wastewater was stopped by the city health authority, as it was shown that the epidemic of cholera which occurred in the city that year was due to the consumption of salad crops irrigated with raw wastewater containing Vibrio cholerae, the bacterium that causes cholera. So then during the period 1975 to 1982, ascaris prevalence in the population of western Jerusalem fell again to the low level of 2 to 3 percent. Now some information on how long excreted pathogens survive in soil and on crop surfaces. First, how long they survive in the soil, and these figures are for warm climates, with temperatures in the range 20 to 30 degrees C. Enteroviruses can survive for up to about 100 days, but usually only for 20 days at most. Bacteria, such as E. coli and Salmonella, for up to 70 days, but usually only for 20 days. Vibrio cholerae, on the other hand, survives for up to 20 days, but usually less than 10 days. Protozoan cysts and oocysts are roughly the same as Vibrio cholerae, and helminth eggs, ascaris eggs in fact, can survive for many months, even years. Their survival on crop surfaces is much less, as they are exposed to direct sunlight, and they desiccate as well. The green figures on the chart tell us that enteroviruses usually survive for less than 15 days. 
bacteria such as E. coli and salmonella for less than 20 days, but Vibrio cholerae and protozoan cystinosis for generally no more than two days, and Ascaris eggs generally for only up to a month. Now a word about diarrhoea, and there's a lot of it about. This table gives the incidence of diarrheal disease in industrialised and developing countries, and in the world as a whole, in the year 2000. Most diarrheal disease occurs in the under fives in both industrialised and developing countries, although the incidence is much higher in developing countries. In the world as a whole, the incidence of diarrheal disease was 0.4 per person per year in the over fives, a little higher in developing countries and a little lower in industrialised countries. It's important to know the order of magnitude of these incidences of diarrheal disease in the world when we come, in fact in the last of these four presentations, to decide what is the tolerable level of risk of disease from using treated wastewater for crop irrigation, and so determine the degree to which the wastewater should be treated. Now a word on microbiological requirements for foods. This is important because we as engineers are taught that drinking water shouldn't contain any coliform bacteria per 100 ml, so we tend to think that any coliform at all is really bad. But food microbiologists take a somewhat different view. This slide shows the maximum number of total coliforms permitted in some dairy products in the European Union. Butter, 1,000 per 100 grams, milk, 100 per 100 ml, and ice cream, 10,000 per 100 grams. And soft cheeses, typical French cheeses such as brie or camembert, the maximum number of faecal coliforms is 10 to the 7 per 100 grams. And for hard cheese made from raw milk, so typical English cheeses such as cheddar, it's up to 10 to the 7 E. coli per 100 grams. Both these values are about the same as in raw wastewater. And for shellfish eaten raw, such as oysters, up to 300 faecal coliforms per 100 grams is OK. But perhaps even more extraordinary for an engineer, in England the Public Health Laboratory Service, now part of the Health Protection Agency, published in 1999 guidelines for the microbiological quality of ready-to-eat foods. Any food you buy which is meant to be eaten without being cooked, sandwiches for example. For these to be of acceptable quality, their faecal coliform count has to be below 10,000 per 100 grams. Now lettuce is a common constituent of sandwiches, so this raises the interesting question. Should the required microbiological quality of treated wastewater used to irrigate lettuce be any stricter than 10,000 per 100 mil? We will attempt to answer this question in the next two presentations.